I have to say that Caitlin is the greatest friend of all time because after I after every episode you give me your your take. <laughs> My emotional, like, I'm driving through the mountains and I was listening to your podcast and, and I'm going to be pig-headed. Yeah. That's what you're talking about. Being pig-headed? Yeah, when I texted you, when you, I tried to call her twice. I tried to call you twice. I was in, in Israel. Israel. Yeah. And I started to get that, like, international ring sound and I was like, uh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, oh. <laughs> so what She's you, in Israel. Hang up. <laughs> wait, what are you going to be pig-headed about? Because you said in your episode about being pig-headed about spending time with other mom friends yeah be pig-headed and about so it I here we you are and i was like i'm gonna be pig-headed and um and we I, need to spend more time together i feel like you're pretty good at that in general are you or is it just with me because we have a connect <laughs> uh, um yeah i think i'm pretty good at that i definitely am the person in a lot of my relationships that's the one being like hey coffee on tuesday okay yeah. how about next tuesday <laughs> Yeah. And even in the pandemic, you were like, I'll just like bundle up my children and like go to this person's backyard. And like you've created like beautiful friendships that way. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, the first four months of the pandemic, we locked down. Yeah. My husband and I were like, well, there's this thing out there and the hospitals are overloaded. And like the safest thing to do is just not get it. So right. to not get it, right. <laughs> we're just, just going to stay move, in our house. Don't move. Right. right. And then after that, I think maybe in like a rebound from that, I was seeking connection. I mean, who wouldn't be, right? Yeah, I'm so glad you saw a connection with me. Aww. Yay. I remember when I met you. Uh, when in a, We did a Starbucks booking. Mm -hmm. You were the main voice. I was the, <laughs> I was the barista. And um, I think I just had to say like, mocha frap or something. And we got paid the same amount of money. Right, because like we get the stu we got like the session fee and then the residuals, <laughs> the residuals, and it didn't matter that you had like a page of text, and I was like, "Mocha frap." Oh, God, the good old days, you guys. I talk so much more now for so much less money. <laughs> Professionally, I wouldn't have it any other way, but I mean, but maybe I would. So we met on that job, but the time I always think of as like when we connected, we went to an audition. You had Ness with you which means I already had Rowan, mm. and we walked right. all the way down to the West Village with yeah. Ness in the carrier. Do you remember? Yeah. And I don't remember why we decided to do that, but he, we would like we were passing him back and <laughs> forth because he was a heavy. Because we would, I would normally walk, right? Like in my former life, I would go home and go to work, and I live in New York City, so I would walk, and I just wasn't really prepared for not doing that anymore and you were like okay i'm here for it okay and i was i didn't think i never even told you this is gonna surprise you i was wearing the most terrible shoes oh. and my feet were in so much pain oh, no. on that walk and when we got downtown i was like the blisters oh, on my no. feet but we were having this moment we were having this beautiful walk and we were sharing like deeply personal things about yeah. motherhood yeah funny what brings us together today and, and passing Ness back and forth to take turns carrying was we walked whatever it was, like three miles or four miles, and I, I didn't want to stop, so I didn't tell you, you know <laughs> until today about my blisters. Well, I'm so sorry about that. Are you doing okay? <laughs> yeah, or you I'm good now. Okay, you're good. You didn't walk here. No. I'm glad. From Brooklyn, no. Okay, good. Um, so actually, I'm, I'm now tracing all of these moments together, and you were pregnant during that, you were about to pop during that uh, session for Starbucks. Was I? That yeah. I remember. And you were telling me that you were going to make sure that this kid was going to be bilingual in French, even though you don't speak French. Yeah. By the way, he's eight He's now? about to be eight. Yeah. And he is. Yes. Both you my kids are. did that. And then the next time I remember seeing you was after he was born and you told the room, we were at Roger Becker's um, audition. I mean, uh, you know, Maureen Kelly, but Roger was holding the session. Right. And a bunch of voiceover actors were sitting down and you had just given birth and you were like back from maternity leave, I guess. Whatever and that was. Whatever that was for right. us. Right. And you said, no one tells you that coming back to your life, it's not the same life and you're not the same person. <laughs> it's like, uh, you compared it to being, um, like a phoenix, a phoenix rising from the ashes. Mm -hmm. And I never forgot that. And so when I saw you with Ness all those many months later, Ness is five, so it was like three or four years later, right? That I saw you and we connected and I just, I, I always thought of you in this motherhood journey. And I, 
always thought of what you said about a phoenix rising from the ashes because the phoenix is stronger than it was before. But the ashes, that's dark. <laughs> <laughs> what did you mean? So I have worked with kids and families basically since I was a kid. And so I thought I knew. I yeah. thought I knew what it was going to be like to have a kid. But I had this picture in my mind that I was going to like have this baby and tuck him in my back pocket and just like go on with my life. And that, as any mom will tell you, is not what happens. Is it not what happens for everyone or is it just not what happens for us? Because I, I feel like it could. It is I'm not, holding space for that possibility for Laura, let's say. <laughs> it is not what has happened for any of the close friends in my life, but mm-hmm. I won't close the door on it being a possibility for somebody. Okay. But I thought that's what was going to be what happened for me, and it was not. <laughs> yeah. And it um, is not. So, no, so. It's, it, it, life is totally different. Um. So I had to come to terms as a new mom with how different my life was going to be, and I fought it. Mm. And so I think I had a very tough first six months, maybe a year, Mm. for a couple of reasons. I had a difficult labor and delivery story. I'm happy to talk more about if you're curious. I'm... Um, so I had a difficult recovery from mm. my fir- having my first son, very different with my second son. Mm. Um, and also this psychological piece, this piece of like, I, I needed to find acceptance for how dramatically changed my life was. Yeah. And I fought it, and I think it made it harder on myself. Because once I found the acceptance, then we found our groove, you know? But You and Rowan. You and, and my Christian, husband. And your husband. Yeah. yeah. I'm actually really, I am curious about the physical toll that it took. Um but I'm, but because I know you and we have a fluidity, I, I feel like I, the, the audience is better served by us really talking about the anxiety, the emotional experience that can happen, you know, on a, on a system, I, I speak for myself, on a system that is already prone to anxiety. Mm-hmm. So like for me, when I was experiencing, I think it was, postpartum anxiety or depression I just thought that's kind of me I'm kind of morose like I'm kind of a darkie to begin with like Mm -hmm. I I didn't I I didn't know that there were other layers or other centers like the motherhood center which I didn't end up going to but anyway I I, I'm curious what your experience was in in the realm of mental health when it came to like accepting that it, that new experience, that new person that you became, and like what that journey looked like for you. Right, it must but, have been a journey. You said it took six to six months to a year. Yeah, to, yeah. yeah. And it's interesting because you say like the phoenix rising from the ashes, which is the metaphor I used at that time. And the ashes are dark. Um, I think that darkness was about me not anticipating it and it being a very different experience. And so this idea that like, oh, what I thought was going to be. Okay, let me back up. So when my first son was born, my mother came to stay with us in Brooklyn. And my mother's a lactation consultant and a pediatric nurse. And so no pressure. She, no just, pressure. Just right. No, zero. that was all. But it was awesome. And I really like, here I am home with this baby a couple weeks. And I want to like hand him to her and like just go out with my husband like for lunch and drinks and walk around the neighborhood, whatever like we used to do. Just for a little bit. <laughs> And it just felt completely different Mm. because the connection I had to this tiny little person, like there was now a piece of my brain and my heart reserved for him that like, and I tried just tried to explain this to the other day, to him the other day at seven years old, that like when he's at school or he's somewhere else, there's always a piece of me dedicated to where he is, what he might be doing, how he's feeling. And I had to get used to having that in my System. system and in my just everyday awareness and and I don't know if your brain works this way but so now it's like I have whatever I'm focusing on and me and then I have like where's my husband and what he's doing and what's going on with him over here and I have two kids now so then there's Rowan over here and Griffin over here and it's like I have these spaces in my mind and in my mm. heart where I'm I'm just sort of monitoring all day long mm. where are y'all what are you up to you know you're also a boss I run my own company. But the, yep. the, the, you know, the people that you work for and your clients, they hold a different space in your brain, I'm assuming. Yeah, that's Although a different... Although there's, there's that. It, that doesn't run on the sort of low-level hum that my kids are always present in my mm. mind in this low-level hum no matter what else I'm doing. Mm. Um, my business 
is it just it's not the same it's no. not the same kind of presence in my mind as much as I love it and it's incredibly fulfilling but mm. it's not um it's not the same but you asked about anxiety so I'll go back to that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I ask about anxiety and I just want to root it always in serving whoever's listening who probably experiences anxiety yes. and many of us do because it's in the air because yeah. it is in the air. I mean, it's we have to be honest about that, that it's not a matter of, like, the individual at this point. The collective is buzzing. Yeah. Yeah. So whatever we can shed light on, that would be, that'd be awesome. So I grew up with anxiety. Mm-hmm. I don't think we talked about it in the same way when I was a kid, that we talk about it now with our kids, at least mm-hmm. in my family. Um, my parents, I'm an only child, my parents had what I now know through my own, you know, anxiety and therapy journey, um, what we would call checking behaviors. Oh. So like, I remember going on a road trip and getting, you know, partway out of the city on this road trip and having to turn around and go home because neither of my parents could remember for sure whether they'd turned off the coffee pot. So that need to like check. I have that. I don't end up going back. I like there are some times where I like leave the house and I'm like, did I turn off the oven? Mm-hmm. And then I just like have images of the house burning down, but like I just keep going. So it so turns I don't check, out, but I have that th- thought. Wow. So it turns out that checking behavior actually increases our anxiety. So mm-hmm. my absolutely brilliant therapist has explained to me because each time we check, we validate for ourselves. Oh, good for me. Yes, there was a reason I sh- that I was anxious about that. It's so a good thing I checked it. But all that does is increase your anxiety, and then you want to go check it again. And then it increases your children's anxiety because that you're teaching them a behavior that may or may not be linked to their own feelings, but the behavior itself increases anxiety. Right. So in my house growing up, this wasn't like an absolute everyday occurrence. It, it often was around things like travel. So we'd be like on our way to the airport, and there would be multiple conversations of like, you have the tickets, you have the boarding passes, you have our passports, right? That kind of yes. checking, right? Yes. So I grew up around that, but we didn't know, I didn't know what it was. We didn't, we didn't talk about it. And I definitely experienced that myself. So then in my 20s, you know, before I was married, before I was a mom and I had my own, you know, oven was one for me. Like, did I turn the stove <laughs> off? Did I turn the oven off? Is the door locked? You know, those kind of things. The door is um, <laughs> um, And when I decided to have a baby, I was really dedicated to not passing that on to him. Mm. I really didn't want to um, model those behaviors. Listen, my my kids are, you know, genetically, they have anxiety on both sides of their family, multiple generations, like, you know. They come by it on. There's only so much I can do, right? But, But there is so much you can do. Right. And so one of the things that I was really dedicated to was not putting these checking behaviors on display for my son. And I'm really proud to say that I did it. And it was not easy. <laughs> mm. I don't want to give the mom curious audience the impression that it was like, oh yeah, you just snap your fingers and like you just don't do those things anymore. Well, because it's a compulsive behavior that's also rooted in um, the way you were parented. So it's like comes you know it it comes to you on both sides it's a soothing behavior Mm. more than a compulsive behavior it's Mm. a it's a like i feel anxious about this thing and so i want to do this action that will Mm. decrease that anxiety but the decrease is is very temporary and then you actually trigger this increase right so um i found the motivation of knowing that i was going to have this little person and that i could change that cycle right i could make a change there for him extremely motivating and so i was able to stop um again like wonderful therapist did a lot of hard work like it wasn't like i just woke up one day and was like all right i'm done with that um so that is actually something i'm really proud of and i don't so far again my kids are only three and seven about to be four and eight but i don't so far see any of those checking behaviors in them so Mm. i'm counting that as a mom win for the moment yes Please get a hallelujah for the mom win wherever we can find them, especially when they're they're big like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the other really interesting thing about anxiety is that um, when I got pregnant with my first, my anxiety went way down. And this is something I talked to my therapist about too, that that's actually something that can happen when you have heightened anxiety pre-pregnancy. That's just sort of part of your makeup. Mm-hmm. That sometimes when you're pregnant, it can exacerbate it and make it stronger. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it can actually diminish it. And I don't know the science behind it. You're out of my my pay league here. We have to get a, a therapist mom on to talk about that. 
But that's what happened with Rowan, and it was such a gift. Wow. It was such a gift. To see the world for a second through sort of more relaxed To be able to breathe a little easier. Wow. Um, You know, I had by that point in my journey, like, really done the work on my anxiety, and I was doing well, and I wasn't interfering with my day-to-day life in any way. But it was work. It was daily work. Yeah. And then with my pregnancy, it diminished to the point that it wasn't it wasn't daily work anymore. Wow, and awesome. I had braced myself for maybe it's going to get worse because how much anxiety could you get during pregnancy about all the things related to your pregnancy, right? Sure. I mean, Although I do realize that like when you are, when your nervous system is just taxed and used to that itchy feeling, it can just glom on to any reason to validate the itchiness. And by itchiness, That's true. I mean, yeah. you know anxiety and yeah and mood mood disorders you know the the details or the specifics of the experience pregnancy or not sometimes are just like uh, i feel uncomfortable it must be this narrative yeah but it didn't that wasn't the experience for you no thankfully i'm so glad yeah you know um as i said like tough birth tough delivery tough year postpartum but like There were gifts of it too, right? So some things were harder for me than maybe other moms and some things got easier for me than maybe other moms. And I guess the message there is like diversity of mom experience. There's no one experience that's going to be forever, that everybody's going to have the same experience. Yeah, it's sort of the, the, the whole thing, life and death, right? Bringing life into the world. I mean, it, it really highlights what's already there, what's always been there. You know, like, mm-hmm. and what's always been there is that everyone really is so different. Mm-hmm. I think for a long time, like, um, outside of outside of motherhood, we can sort of blend in a little bit more, and and not for everyone, but but a little bit more. And then all of a sudden, when you're raw like that, when you're exposed like that to yourself, to this little person, to the people around you, it's like you can't unsee what's what's underneath there you know i also think you know our my experience has been and i think yours has been similar what you've shared with me that like our kids were born with their own authentic selves yeah (laughs) and that is a beautiful thing because i'm getting to know this person and so like i very lovingly will say to my kids like i made this elbow (laughs) or like yeah i made this toe you know because it's that to me is like the amazing, miraculous experience of like, I, like I literally will say, I, like I grew you inside of me. Yeah. How did that happen? Yeah. You know. And now my little one, he's very interested in babies right now because some kids in his class have had younger siblings recently. I've been talking about it a lot, so there's a lot of discussion of like, when you grew me in your uterus, and like I grew in your uterus, and he's like very interested in that. Um, so there is the piece of me that's like, I, I made you, I grew you, and then there's the piece of like. But you came to me, your own authentic self from yeah. day one. Yeah. I mean, it's so real and so obvious. I mean, particularly with Ness and with Rowan. I just said Ness and Rowan. Ness and <laughs> Rowan. Um, can, you, can you speak to, like, this big, beautiful person who is nearly eight years old and writes haikus? Amazing. Right. Rowan. How did we get there? How did he get to be almost eight? I don't know, but he started reading at two. At two, yeah. I mean, he's so many more things than his intellect, actually, and I think that we really... I just want to say that real quick because I do find that particularly with um, little boys, we just, we just glom on to their... Either their sportsmanship or you know their athleticism or their brains, and we want to quantify it and we want to like validate that experience. And yeah, it's great that he's he's a genius. <laughs> he's so smart, as is Ness. And like, uh, there's more to him, and I know that. I also know that when a child is um, that brilliant, that young, you know. It, it it it's it's a lot for the mom. <laughs> Can you speak to raising um, ex- an exceptional learner, and, uh, especially as an educator, what that experience might be like for you? Or did you see my face when you used the word genius? <laughs> I know you hated it. I know you hate it. What, what can I tell you? Um, we're. I, it's funny because I just. Um, I'm wary of labels like that. Having a child who is 
atypical, right? And I'm not like secretive about who Rowan is because that's his mm. authentic self. But I, I worry about mm-hmm. his his personal narrative. I want him to be the one to develop his like personal mythology as yeah. a way I sometimes think about it as opposed to external sources saying like, this is who you are. Yeah. yeah. Well, Which now is- I'm glad I used the word genius so that you could um, lay that out for us. <laughs> So I, that's why I made that face. So I never use that word, although you're certainly not the first person to have used it with of me. Course. So please yeah, don't. Of course. Yeah, of course. And for a long time, we actually didn't even use the word smart. Yeah. I, I don't. I mean, it's it's a great way to make someone feel really self-conscious. And like their whole value is is like bound up in four plus four equals eight. There's only one answer. And if you don't get it right, then you're not the thing that everyone said you were. So here's the funny story about not using the word smart. Rowan was two and a half or three and we were in the elevator in our apartment building and a gentleman got into the elevator with us and said oh I'm going to three can you push three and so Rowan pushed three and he said you're so smart yeah so you know for context and these are some details I don't often share but for context Rowan was reading fluently in English at two fluently in French at three he's an atypical kid when it comes to his cognition so identifying the number three on the elevator button panel was not um, a surprise right there was that gentleman could have asked him something way more complex and he would have been fine with it so Rowan was confused by this feedback and he looked at me after the person got out of the elevator he's polite about it but he looked at me and he said like what did that mean when that person said I was smart because we never two and a half oh i'm so happy for him because we never used that word Mm -hmm. and what i said in the moment i tried to come up with the best answer i could i said what it means when somebody says you're smart is they think something you've said or done is interesting but instead of making an i statement and saying i think that's really interesting they said something about you you're smart you're this you're that Mm -hmm. and that worked for him in that moment that resonated for him he got it and and we've stuck with it so it's worked for us i don't i don't know if that will help with ness or any of the listeners but it's worked for us yeah yeah um you once explained to me an idea that i i I haven't wrapped my head around because as as atypical and developed a brain as ness has mommy's only got this much in her um (laughs) twice exceptional what is that so twice exceptional is when a child or an adult frankly is gifted and also has another form of neurodiversity and Mm. that's a really broad category so that could be adhd it could be dyslexia it could be anxiety it could be sensory processing challenges it Mm. could be any number of forms of neurodiversity in addition to being gifted so the twice part the twice you have two forms of exceptionality Um. being gifted and this whatever your other form of neurodiversity is right and so it does uh, sometimes lead to lead to or is coupled with um anxiety it can be it for can sure be for sure yeah and sensory processing what is that um so let's back up a second on neurodiversity right so neurodiversity just means the diversity in the way that human beings process information Hmm. right so it describes the state of human beings it's not a diagnosis that one person would get and somebody wouldn't right we we as a species are neurodiverse and it's actually essential to our species for us to thrive we need that Um, hence the village right so we need someone to go fetch the water and someone to start the fire and okay well let me ask it to you this way if we want something different like a cure for cancer or a solution to climate change, why do we think forcing all of our children to process information the same way is going to get us a different result out the other side? Mm. It doesn't make any sense, right? So that's that's neurodiversity, right? It's not a, um, a diagnosis. It's just a state of human beingness, right? right? We are all neurodiverse. Okay, there are specific forms of neurodiversity that come with labels or diagnoses for better or for worse, like ADHD, like dyslexia, like... Um, Sensory processing, I don't think, is actually an official diagnosis, but it is something people talk about. We're aware of. Um, so that the sensory wanna... processing, meaning the way you process the sensorial experience, might mm-hmm. be different than anybody than somebody else, but also could could lead to discomfort. Like with Ness, it's like um, I'm trying to think what sense he um, is extremely musical, which means his ears are like super developed. You know. Um, and is and and that can lead to like w- amazing language skills, and certain sounds at certain times of the day, like the sound of the bath, could be really irritating to him if he's yeah. tired. Yeah. So 
sensory processing, the way he processes that sensorial experience can be rattling to his system. Completely. And it could be a feeling, you know, it could be, it could be a lot of, you know, some kids who have sensory processing challenges can't stand the feeling of the tags in their clothing or the seams in their socks. Yeah. Um, you know, or it could be um, the way that your body relates to your physical space, mm-hmm. you know. Um, some kids, for example, um, when we were, thank you, pandemic, doing remote school, um, you know, Rowan did great if he had like a, a wobble cushion on his chair or like a oh. yoga ball to sit on because oh. it was giving his body sensory feedback oh. that was helping him be successful with this change. If I think about in a group of kids, this could be like a classroom environment, but it doesn't have to be. It's true in a homeschool co-op. It's true in a play group. It's true in a million settings, right? We're getting a lot of sensory input from being in that space. We're hearing things, we're feeling things, we're smelling things, right? We're seeing things. And so when that sort of sensory experience was narrowed because I'm interacting with my class on a computer screen right. on Zoom, right. a lot of kids, my son won, but many, many in my practice and friends and everybody, their kids needed some additional sensory input. Wow. And so in our case, a yoga ball was great. Or when I say a wobble cushion, it's this like little cushion that goes in the seat that wiggles a little. It doesn't hold steady. So Wait, he gets so a the little input from it need to work a little bit to keep him balanced and wow that's so cool some some kids need fidget toys or a weighted blanket uh that my my kids don't like to sit down to eat like they're just not that motivated by food Mm -hmm. which is like what but okay so i I give them a, a weighted blanket to just like keep them seated and that sensory input is enough to like finish the meal for the most part um, yeah, in our house, we call it a calming blanket. A calming blanket, yeah. yeah. I, I, it feels like more and more kids are coming up with these um, sensory processing disorders and or, or, or maybe, I don't know. I, I, I get a lot of um, feedback that people are dealing with this more and more. And I'm wondering um, if you see that a lot in your practice and if maybe the pandemic heightened that experience. Because I know that... Also, I have friends who are having a hard time finding like therapists and um, occupational therapists or physical therapists or food therapists. We've had the hardest time finding a food therapist for pause because everyone's booked. Um, and I'm wondering what your uh, what your thoughts are. Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, we've seen throughout the pandemic and now, you know, particularly that there has been a major increase in. Um, what we might think of as executive functioning challenges Mm. in kids. And so executive functioning is the set of skills that allows you to successfully execute a task. It's organization, it's time management, it's breaking down a long-term project, it's keeping yourself organized, handing something in, you know, when you needed to and not doing it and forgetting it. And there's, you did the assignment, but you just never handed it in. Um, Focus, stamina, you know, all of these pieces. And um, there has been a major uptick in executive processing challenges that we've seen, in part, I believe, because pandemic schooling put developmentally inappropriate demands on kids' executive functioning. Um, But did we have a choice, I wonder? Well, listen, I think that um, schools were making decisions moment by moment in very unexpected circumstances and sometimes just to keep everybody going one more day and safe and alive one more day they were making decisions based on that and not on right based on fear and not based on what we know is best in terms of child development or educational practices Mm -hmm. right and um, as a result, some of what came out of that was really not developmentally appropriate for the kids. And and I mean, I can be specific. It's yeah, things like a do. child, you know, a child having to manage a dozen different Zoom links in a week and get themselves into the right Zoom at the right time. I mean, the teachers weren't even successfully navigating that, much I less your 10-year-old, you I, know? I'm like nearly 40 years old. I couldn't do it. Right. Or a schedule that changes every day or every week, you know, some of the hybrid schedules, as great as it was for kids to be able to be back in school part-time, if that was what their families chose, often meant like we had an A week and a B week. And so like this week, I go to school in person Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and I'm on Zoom Tuesday, Thursday, but like next week I'm on Zoom Monday and Tuesday, and I'm in school just on Wednesday. That is not an appropriate 
demand on the executive functioning of uh, an elementary schooler or a middle schooler, and even in some cases, our younger high school kids. Right. I mean, boring sameness is what Magda Gerber talks about with very small children, but I believe that to be um, really helpful in general. Like, boring sameness for children is so soothing. Every day we eat at the same time, we go to the same place. I mean, of course, like, adventures are great and whatever else but the unpredictability is traumatic it's just too much on a developing mind well and i think part of the bigger problem even than that is that we weren't having this conversation about these demands being developmentally inappropriate so our kids were internalizing I'm not living up to this expectation. Oh, we didn't have the conversation I'm failing, with them. Right. I'm failing to meet this expectation. And so they were not being told, in my opinion, they were not being told explicitly enough, this expectation is unreasonable, right? It is not your fault. Yeah, I, I had that experience with Ness. He was not, he was like four years old and he was struggling and I was struggling. And a child cannot regulate against a dysregulated system and they you know we are co-regulating we are in a relationship with these children so back to our conversation around you know our anxiety and managing ourselves that was a petri dish of fucking (laughs) (laughs) hell (laughs) because they were dysregulated naturally of course this was not a normal time and the parents were of course dysregulated so were the educators i mean you did your best as as an educator to come in with uh with with your team and really help from from whatever way you could i'm sure but the whole world was off i think this is a nice opportunity to also talk about it's it, it relates to this but generally the expectation or the difficulty managing a child with exceptional needs or exceptional abilities on the parent Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. as a non-mom or people who are curious about motherhood looking at someone who is already in it you know it seems overwhelming yeah you want to go first or you want me to go first well i I find (laughs) it overwhelming that's the truth i mean You don't launch a podcast about um, motherhood unless you're fucking curious how to do it, do it good. And I, I'm really, I find it, you know, keeping up with um, an exceptional learner for me has been, um, it's challenging. It's fun. It's definitely fun. I mean, it's really cool when like, he's like, you know, making a map of the world and he literally knows every country uh, you know in the world it's so beautiful i mean his mind is really so fun and i remember feeling like oh, how do i meet these needs when i'm just like kind of i have skills but they're not in the executive functioning <laughs> arena and um and it's an unfolding for me for sure but i do look to caitlin often because this is this is your area of expertise, and still you find it it challenging, yeah? Or is that yeah, my, oh, yeah. my projecting? Okay. No, absolutely. I think the, f- the first answer, Laura, is <laughs> it's going to be challenging and accept the challenge, you know, in the sense of like, not like, yes, I'm up, but acceptance for the challenge, right? Um, and grace, giving ourselves grace that we're not always going to make the right decisions. <laughs> um, and... You know, I was just having a whole conversation about motivation and kids' motivation and how we have intrinsic or internal motivation. And then there's the idea of extrinsic motivation, which is like sticker charts or, you know, if you do this thing, then you get some reward or some consequence or whatever. And how what we really want to be fostering is intrinsic motivation and not replacing it with an external motivation for our kids. But at the end of the conversation, I go like, but listen, like, we've all been there. I have been the mom who has said, like, just get in the car and I will give you a cookie, you know? like. (laughs) Cookies are a great parenting tool. (laughs) So I think just knowing that it's not going to look like it does on Instagram or on Pinterest and you have to give yourself grace and and it's going to be okay in that regard, I think is is huge on a more practical level um, because I live this with my own children and because I help other parents with this, I can give something sort of more practical and tangible than that. Um, 
following your child's lead about what interests them, number one, but where they're comfortable and Mm -hmm. where they're uncomfortable Mm -hmm. is so key, I think, for any child, but particularly a child that is exceptional in some way. Um, You know, I used to say to people, and now we'll go back to the anxiety conversation a little bit. It's all connected. I, used I mean, to, we're a holistic system. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say to people, you know, my son, when I was talking about my older son, my son is an observer. He needs a chance to get a sense of what's happening in a new situation or with new people. And then once he's had that opportunity, he will join in and he will be a part of that in a way that's authentic for him and works for him. If you tried to force him in before he had the chance to figure that out for himself, it would be a disaster. And and he's gotten much more sort of uh, comfortable and better with this as he's gotten older. But when he was little, this was particularly true. So um, I found myself a lot of the time feeling like I was running interference, like on behalf of my son with other people saying yeah. like, just like, no, don't take his shoe off for him. Mm. Give him a minute, and when he is ready to enter the space, he will take his shoes off, and he will enter the space. Yeah, I have that all the time, where I'm like, don't dress him. Like, he is capable of getting dressed. He's just... You know, and because my son, you know, did read so early, and he would really enjoy reading like while he was riding in the stroller on the way to preschool he would be reading a chapter book and so people would be sort of taken aback by that and they would want to oh for example take a video and so I had to like run the interference and say like I'm, you really can't take a video of my son that's not we're not comfortable with that thank you <laughs> you know and so establishing those boundaries and I will say that having a background in performance and being a voiceover actor helped because we're so used to putting up a fourth wall Mm. (laughs) that my husband would look at me with our son and he would go how can you do that like we're on the playground and all of a sudden you've like created this safe space for you guys Mm. that other people are are respecting that boundary I was like I think what I'm doing is putting up a fourth wall the way I do as an actor but I hadn't put the pieces together (laughs) that's so interesting because uh, because my acting experience is like no fourth wall here are my insides (laughs) you know I, no, and and you you did something really beautiful um, yesterday where you texted me. And you're like, I'm willing to say this, and I, I say this as a service to the listener, please, because um, I'm hey Daniela, you're one of my closest friends. You know, ev- like a lot about me, <laughs> and like a lot of that is not for the public, and a lot of it is is. Here are the bullet points of what's cool and what's not cool. We talked about it, and that was like such an adult experience. <laughs> and I do feel safe, you know, I, I feel safe in your container. And I and that and and maybe in those moments with Rowan, you were having like a practice in that, in the same way that you probably did as an actor, but in that safe space that you were creating for your family, what's cool, what's not cool. Um, it's such an adult experience. (laughs) (laughs) But I also find that when you have those conversations respectfully and mutually respectfully, I don't get drama over it. I don't get pushback over it, whether it's with you. And obviously, like, we have a long, loving relationship. But with teachers at my son's school, if there's something where I say, you know, we sort of have a boundary around this as a family value, as long as I'm having that conversation out of mutual respect, I don't find that people are resistant to it. I think... People are are open to respecting other people's boundaries. I I think that people get nervous or uncomfortable if they don't know where your boundaries are, mm. because then they're worried about trespassing. Mm. I don't know. That's been my experience, and maybe coming out of the pandemic and having a kid like Rowan, I I've just found my own authenticity with that. I I don't know. Maybe you hit on a growth moment for me, Daniela. I think that was a growth <laughs> moment, actually. And it's a growth moment for me, too, because I think there was a time when I wouldn't have received that with so much gratitude, clarity, Mm -hmm. you know, here I am sitting and wanting to be of service to all. And like, I can't do that unless I know where I'm playing in. Mm -hmm. You know, what colors am I what colors am I painting on the, you know, like on the canvas? Mm -hmm. And if like I have all the colors in the world, sure, that's exciting. But like if some are off limits and then then I know, then I know what I get to dig into. 
And I think that that is um, a growth moment for both of us because I think people without boundaries have a hard time when other people's boundaries are being set. Mm. And like, if so, so in that same way, if a person gets uppity or upset when you say like, don't take a picture of my kid reading a book, that's not cool, that's on them. That's their emotional experience. Please delete it. You know, mm-hmm. or if that if that is your boundary, mm-hmm. I'd be like, yeah, isn't he cute? <laughs> <laughs> He's a genius. <laughs> Don't use that word, Rabani. Do not use that word. My very every man's, every woman's response to that is to clean up your side of the street. I think our sort of collective obsession with children and the next generation, myself included, is a dissociative experience. I think when we're really hyper-focused on the children, what we're really saying is, ouchie, I'm not okay. And if you're not okay, there are ways to be okay. I promise there are therapies that we discussed diving into. There's support. Um, there's just community in general, but I think I really believe that the best thing we can do for the world, for the next generation, for ourselves is to, is to start feeling better in our own skin. What do you think? I would add on to that, that, you know, to try to identify when something your child is doing is triggering for you, Mm. why it's triggering for you. Um, because that can help you connect with your child in a way that they benefit from as opposed to from a triggered state. Mm. Um, and then to a- answer the part specifically about, you know, looking at kids and working with kids, I am a huge advocate for self-direction. And self-direction means your child deciding what they want to learn about, what interests them, what they want to pursue. And this relates again to following your child, right? But the idea that, you know, not all of your child's learning time should be coercive in the sense of you saying like, this semester you're doing lacrosse, next semester you're doing science club, right? That there needs to be ample opportunity for your child to say, this is something that interests me and lights me up. And can you as my adult facilitate that for me and give me access to that and help me explore that? Um, Because they will light up and they will learn more and understand how the things that they're learning are interconnected, um, given that opportunity in a way that they never will in a classroom where we say, okay, and now we all open to chapter three and we read about this thing that happened. Um, And so I think for kids' mental health, this opportunity to be self-directed is is Mm. a huge piece of it. I also hear so much in what you're sharing, the level of curiosity that you have around, we talked about Rowan, so specifically Rowan and children in general. And that can't be stressed enough that, that your own curiosity, meaning your presence, your enchantment, your, your love and respect for a child's selfhood, is palpable and very healing for whatever we went through a hard year hard two years hard two years it happened and it happened we have to accept that that happened that there we've been dinged up a little bit in the brain (laughs) us our kids my dog (laughs) can't stop barking um so we accept that and we get curious about who they are, what they like, and uh, yeah, I, I, I like that approach. I hear that a lot in what you're saying. But there's so much more we could say. Okay, so tell me where we can find out more of what you have to say because I get the very, um, very real pleasure of hanging out with you in real life and getting your calls and your texts, but maybe the listener would like some of that too. So they can find me on Instagram at, at Caitlin Greer Meister. 
um, where I am working on demystifying a lot surrounding our kids' education. I don't think any parent should find their child's education mystifying. I think that's a sign of a broken system. So we're working on demystifying that, breaking down the jargon, and giving actionable tips and strategies that parents can use. You learn it today, you're using it by homework time tonight to take a lot of the stress out of what's happening and focus on connection and focus on fostering curiosity in our kids. Um, so that's Instagram at Caitlin Greermeister. And if folks are spell? C-A-I-T-L-I-N-G-R-E-E-R-M-E-I-S-T-E-R. Were you waiting for me to make a mistake on that? Because I was focusing really hard. <laughs> um, and if folks are interested in the tutoring and educational consulting side of what I do, my business we mentioned, that's at greermeistergroup.com. Thank you. Thank you. I love you.